Uh, it makes for you know a little more intimate exchange. You can see a little better some of what uh, our very esteemed guest has for us today. Uh, we're, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Katya Mibara. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Katya Mibara from uh, Grinnell College with us today. Um, she'll say a few words about her background, very interesting background. She is an authority on uh, Jewish and African American diaspora, racism, uh, ways in which these things intersect. And I'll let you tell her tell you just a little bit more about her. But please, uh, if, you know, you might, I, I encourage you to come closer. We've got the perennial empty three rows here. Um, but, you know, you're all grown up and you'll do what you, what you do. Anyway, please join me to welcome Dr. Katya Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not going to speak until everybody is close. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the reason why I'm saying that is not just because, you know, I've got the podium, I've got the mic, I'm the professor at the, oh, at here among all the other professors, but also because I just came from the other room, which is round, and I didn't really expect to speak frontally, and therefore, you know, you can't look at each other and exchange those glances of approval or disapproval. They're all staring at me. And also, the young gentleman in the back who used the English notion, my love, which is so exciting. <laughs> um, so I can't move too much because of the mic. So um, I'm gonna get started. Now, you should all have two colored index cards and I'll tell you what to do with that in a moment, and hopefully you all have a pen so you can write with it. Um, I'm talking because I'm getting used to speaking to the mic and standing stationary. Those of you who are professors walk up and down. So just one quick question. How many people in this um, auditorium space are students? Okay, so that gives me a sense of um, the different places that you're coming from. So I'm gonna tell you about myself. I'm going to, hopefully you are not in the other room so that you don't expect a repeat performance because I don't have a written paper. I have quite a lot of notes. I'm going to share ideas with you, which I hope um, that you will take away and that you will be able to use to brainstorm on different topics. Those of you who are faculty, is this too loud? Because for me it's right, okay. Those of you who are faculty, much of what I'm saying is intended to help you think about the same things that you think about anyway, because we're all with PhDs and we're all older. That's why we've got a PhD, um, so you're not six. But um, to help you refine and perhaps revise some of the ways in which you approach your syllabus for anti-Semitism, a course on anti-Semitism, but also just in general. Those of you who are students, what I would like you to be able to take away is to think in terms of how you would take some of the suggestions or some of the ideas, prompts that I will offer, or that I will share this afternoon, reflections that I will share, and how you would use them in a classroom setting, but also if you were creating workshop settings for your peers. Okay, so first of all, my background. My uh, mother was born in Vienna, Austria in 1930. My grandmother, already in 1933, sensed that the winds of change had arrived, essentially. She sent my grandfather to Palestine, thinking that perhaps they could move to Palestine. He went, he got very, very sick. He fell in love with, the, with, with everything that was around. He came back and he said, you know, Jerusalem, Jaffa, that's what Jews used to look like. He brought back a calendar, he brought all, back all sorts of things, but he was very sick and he said he just simply would not be able to survive, literally he would die physically uh, under the conditions. So my grandmother called her sister who lived in New York and you had to have an affidavit just as you do today, American rules have not changed. There are aspects that are constantly under change, but basically to have uh, a visa into the United States, you need to have someone vouch for you so that you won't be a welfare case, is essentially what it meant. And my grandmother told her sister, who was a nurse working for a doctor, that if she didn't get the affidavit, my grandmother was going to turn on the gas, and um, it, she was going to choose how they were going to die, 
they weren't going to wait. My aunt, my grand aunt, then Anna, she went to the doctor for whom she worked. She literally, the story is, got on her knees and begged him for an affidavit, which he did give. But the United States government at that time, I'm not sure the State Department has changed significantly since then, but certainly then, the State Department did not want Jews. Reluctantly, they gave visas to some. My grandparents were lucky, but my grandfather had to leave behind, had to say goodbye at the station to his mother and to his sister. I'm named for his mother. On my father's side, and then there's a whole, you know, Jewish diaspora, Jewish diversity is very big. So my grandmother's mother was actually Polish and her father was from Frankfurt and the father in Frankfurt, that family cut themselves off. But that comes later in the story. My, on my father's side, my father's from Jamaica and most people in the Caribbean, they also have various other countries that are included in that genealogy. But what matters is that in New York City, uh, they were, he was a black man in New York City. My mother was Jewish, not white Jewish. She was Jewish, Jewish refugee. When they met, I was born when I was 18. I moved, I made Aliyah. Anybody in the room know Hebrew, just so that I have a sense of that as well? Okay, quite a few people. So if I slip, um, you can help out. Um, I made Aliyah when I was 18. And in between, I, was, I grew up in New York City, so I was a member of Hashem Ed Seir and also one of the founders of the Black Student Union at the private school that I went to, which was the Burley School. If you're from New York, you know the Burley School. <clears throat> and I went to Israel, and I did not intend to come back to the States, but when my oldest, I have three children, and my oldest was in 11th grade, I kind of started wondering what it would be like to be in the States, and so I thought I would apply to one school. If I got in, fine. If I didn't get in, that would be fine, too. The Gulf War came, I sort of forgot about it, and the um, Gulf War ended around Purim, and went and picked up my mail. There was a big envelope. If you get a big envelope, you know you were accepted, right? You all remember that. Everybody remembers that. Not everybody. <laughs> no. <laughs> and um, so we went to visit Duke University. I hated it, but I'd only applied to one school. And so we went, and um, in my fourth year, which is when I was completing my PhD, and I have a book, you can look at, you can Google me. Um, and I think uh, Charles and Ira and Carlton are gonna send out my bio and all the other information, including the things I will show you today. Uh, so you'll have that. But I went to Duke University, got my PhD, and I was invited to Grinnell College. Never, not been on a job interview, so I've been at Grinnell since 1996. It's a long time. In that time period, um, of course, I've acquired my experiences as a professor, but the first thing that I want to start with is this notion of identities. I want to start there. And then I'm going to tell you what the reason that you're reading this on screen, and then I'm going to go through some slides, and I'm going to go zigzagging with a number of different points, because that's what I do, and we're on summer vacation, and I don't have a prepared paper to read to you and bore you. And then I'm going to ask you to fill in some questions on your cards, and we'll try to make a little bit of interactive, even though it's frontal. Um, one of the things that's very important to me to point out is that for people like myself, and for many people probably in the room, you have been and lived in different countries. You may have grown up speaking more than one language, or you may have grown up hearing other people in your family speaking languages that you understand behind behind the scenes, as long as they don't speak to you. But in that sense, you have grown up in situations, in contexts which are already cosmopolitan, transnational, international, whatever new term there is, the bottom line is you're not monocultural, to use that terminology. You have multiple identities. You have multiple points at which you identify with different groups of people and with which you are identified. Reading the body today and trying to assume what boxes people belong to is far more complicated than it was 100 years ago, certainly in a place like New York. When I grew up in New York City, basically there were three groups. There were all the whites, that's white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Then there were the Irish and the Italians. Then there were the Jews. Then there were the black Negro at the time, but it was either American or Caribbean, probably uh, Jamaican. Very, very simple. That's not true any longer. So the range of how people look matters because we use the body to think of where people are from. And in fact, that's not where people necessarily are from and certainly not necessarily where they identify or with whom they identify. 
So one of the first principal points of thinking about a syllabus and thinking about a classroom and thinking about what a student is going to learn, what students want to learn, how students might express themselves, how you as professors express yourself, is thinking about this notion of plurality. I'm not saying anything which is new, but I'm highlighting it as something to consciously think about when one thinks of, well, what text am I going to use this semester? What book, what reading, what film am I going to include in my syllabus? Or for students who are doing research projects or who are in a class and uncomfortable but can't quite put their finger on what it is they're not comfortable with that, you don't want to just say, I don't agree, or I believe, or I feel. You want to be able to say, I think because, and you want to be able to have something substantive to, talk, to show, to bring into the classroom to use. So thinking in terms, first of all, of positionality, intersectionality, means starting with yourself, and that's not um, self-absorbent. Rather, that becomes an exterior, external, I don't like the term objective, but a way of thinking about how your reading or how the film that you're screening is going to be interpreted by people in the room. So the notion of identity is very important to me. Secondly, and again drawing on my own background, the notion of histories in the plural is very important. Histories are not simply linear, they are chronological. I was born, I died. In between a set of things happened. They didn't happen zigzag as I'm speaking. On the other hand, the ways in which things unfold certainly happens in ways that are unpredictable, that are not linear. If we think of histories in the plural rather than a history, we're able to incorporate a number of different narratives, a number of different stories, a number of different events. How I think of 1492, when that question is asked, what happened in 1492, the first thing in my mind is not Christopher Columbus. It's expulsion of Jews. Okay? And if I was Muslim, I would also be thinking about the way the Catholic Church treated Muslims. So in that context, Muslims and Jews have much more in, com in, in, in much more that is complementary than in conflict in the year 1492. So we can go through that in very, very different ways. But in that context, I want to point out that histories is very important when we think about timelines and frameworks for how one is going to create a course on anti-Semitism. That's the purpose of your, of your, of your, um, of your summer seminar. So first of all, I put in my syllabus years ago, and some of you may be familiar with the notion of trigger warnings. Okay, it came up a couple of years ago. I have very little patience for it. Part of the reasons I have very little patience is I discovered very, very quickly that the people who argued for trigger warnings were people who generally had not faced war, famine, expulsion, devastation. They just imagined it. And so for me, an institution of education is a place where ideas are exchanged and where ideas are debated which gets into the whole notion currently about freedom of expression, what are the red lines. I'm going to get to the boycott, the BDS in a moment, maybe at the end, maybe not. Um, but I have this, and you can read it, I think, here larger than in the other room. But basically, I drew from Hollywood on the assumption that on day one, I could say to students, well, if something's going to be, if you're sensitive, this may not be the place for you. Because I know that if we're going to deal with issues of anti-Semitism, we have to deal with issues also of racism. And since the context for me at the moment is the United States, the context of racism is going to be slavery, and it's going to be slavery of the transatlantic. And so I'm not going to filter it. And if it's European genocide, I'm not going to filter out the films that I use because of sensibilities of students. I start the semester with um, a particular film that has its problems. Um, one can critique, I do want to show it to you. Not the film, I just want to show you the title. It's called Night in Fog. Some of you are familiar with it, Alain René. You can find it on uh, YouTube. But it does the best job possible in 30 minutes of graphically showing what the French saw for the first time when they saw that film 
even though it doesn't explicitly blame the French. So that's the purpose of, of my speaking right now. I want to switch screens, and I might have to have Ira help me. Um, I just go to PowerPoint. OK. I think I got it. All right. So let me go through some slides, having said those three pillars for you. The title, as um, my colleague pointed out, is Amnesia, Erasure, and Omissions as the Context for Teaching Today. Amnesia is about total loss of memory. We don't remember. We really don't remember. Maybe it's in the subconscious, maybe it's not, but we don't remember. And if you don't remember long enough, you have nothing to pass on. You can't tell the stories. The second is erasure, which is the removal of all traces of something. It's obliteration. It's just we're not going to tell the story. And omission is the most egregious because it is very intentional. Omission is I know that I could provide information, but I'm not going to. Because I'm speaking today and not last week, I can point out, unfortunately, that you had an opportunity, I believe, to hear Benny Morris. Yes, Benny Morris spoke. Yep. And it's very important then that you look up Benny Morris's most recent op-ed in Haaretz, in which he sharply criticizes the fact that the archives that he used have been shut, have been closed, and he critiques the government for doing that. Now, why do I raise that here at the very beginning? Because if you're teaching a course on anti-Semitism and contemporary anti-Semitism, you have no choice but to deal with it your, for yourselves. It doesn't have to be in the course. But you have to think about how will you respond to criticism of the Israeli government as opposed to criticism of the state of Israel. And I suggest that those are two very different enterprises. Those are very two different projects. And part of the task of a professor is to figure out how do we deal with inconvenient truth? How do we deal with the inconvenient at the same time that we don't want to reinforce it? So one of the ways to do it is to find readings and to find selections that the students are going to find anyway, but to find it on our own terms, on terms that are written, films that are made, jokes that are told, op-eds that are written, but that come from a place of love. I don't mean Christian love but a place of concern for the soul, not just for the purpose of criticizing in order to obliterate. So when does the topic of anti-Semitism, at least in North America and in, uh, in the UK, become particularly problematic to teach? When does the story of hatred and racism against Jews disappear so that it's not even woven into courses about racism? I suggest that it begins with the emphasis on the West, whiteness, and the rest. That is the notion of whiteness studies. How many of you are familiar with whiteness studies in its historical context? OK, so whiteness studies begins in the 1990s, more or less. It's, it's pretty important. Hold on one second. This is. I can't, but somebody, somebody can. can. <laughs> okay. Oh, step back from the mic, okay. Okay, good. So I just use the down. Yeah, okay. Uh, whiteness studies. So whiteness studies is at the beginning of the 1990s. It's a very important move academically in order to begin to look at the ways in which ideas about whiteness as an identity, whiteness as a way of being positioned, become significant in the political arena and have an impact in the arena of economics and also specifically attention to how privilege functions. Another way of thinking about it was that whiteness studies gave us a vocabulary which I would suggest, and we don't have time for that here today, but I would suggest as a footnote for you to look up if you're interested, it had already been taken up as a topic by people like W.E.B. Du Bois, by Frederick Douglass, by a whole lot of people um, before, the 19, uh, before the 1990s. 
But whiteness studies does allow for discussion of generic whiteness. It allows for discussion of what happened to the immigrants who had been othered and had been treated as racially different with the vocabulary of racial difference, as in European races, where did they disappear? So whiteness studies enable that, enable the discussion of privilege and power. In the same context, then, multiculturalism became a way to give attention to the people who had been omitted from the curriculum. But what it didn't do was include Jews. So multicultural studies expands, and it expands with Jews outside. It expands where Jews have been pushed into whiteness studies. How the Jews became white becomes a very popular term along with how the Irish became white and the Italians became white. The default there is that Jews must be white because Jews come from Europe. Gone is any discussion of Jewish diversity. And the third topic where not anti-Semitism sort of disappears completely from discussion is the rise of Islamophobia, which is a very significant movement after 9-11 in particular, and it's one that we cannot minimalize. Depending on where one is in the country, one hears more or less about it, and that's true globally as well. So let's jump to 1967. How many of you know who James Baldwin is? Oh good, everybody does. James Baldwin was a very, very significant Ameri uh, American writer who was a black American writer, who is a black gay American writer. All of those box terms are terms that probably James Baldwin would have rejected. Um, there are two films, this is my footnote, and I'll give you some recommendations as I'm moving along. Very important two films to see, I highly recommend them, by the Haitian-French filmmaker Raoul Peck. Not only has Raoul Peck made films about Rwanda, um, which are significant, but in the context here, one is on James Baldwin, and the other is on the young Karl Marx. And it took somebody who's not an American to include four different references to Karl Marx's self-knowledge about his background as the son of a converted Jew, and four references to anti-Semitism that are just simply woven into the script. It's a very important film to see. Most people think of Karl Marx in his uh, time with a white beard and as an old man. This goes back to the beginning. And James Baldwin writes in 1967 um, an article in the New York Times with a very provocative title that created a lot of conversation, in fact, created a lot of debate. And what he wrote essentially, I think the key, <coughs> has the Jew become an American white person? in effect, a Christian. So what did he mean by that? Well, what he meant by that was that American Jews had become very comfortable in their American whiteness. Why was it so significant? I don't know if this is large enough for you to be able to, to read the text. It's too much text on a page, my husband says, but I have it there nevertheless. But what was so um, controversial at that time and less controversial today was this was written right after the civil rights movement had reached its point of dissolution. And yet Jews were overwhelmingly, in other words, they were out of disproportionately part of the civil rights movement, especially the young people in the South. So it felt very, very uncomfortable to a lot of American Jews who became very upset at being identified as white and of being um, simply Written, written off is how it was experienced. But today when we read that the Negro is singled out, the Jew is singled out by Negroes because he acts differently from other white men, but because he doesn't. His major distinction is given him by that history of Christendom, which has so successfully victimized both Negroes and Jews. And he's playing in Harlem the role assigned him by Christians long ago. He is doing very dirty work. In other words, Jews are involved in money, in exploitation. This was a very New York context. I cite this here because this particular essay is making the rounds again on, on campuses, both for those who are trying to understand the relationship between Jews and blacks, which has become popular all over again, it seems to come and go. I have a review of 
the book that I think is the most important book written on the subject by Eric Sundquist. And you can find the reference in my, in my CV, but I recommend Eric Sundquist very much. But this question of Jews and money is a question that does not disappear. And it's being played with again in the White House as one example. And if any of you have the opportunity to be in London before you return to wherever it is that you came from before you came to Oxford, I urge you to visit the Jewish Museum, which has a wonderful exhibition right now, not just on British uh, Jews, but actually Jews, Myth, and Money. And it is a really, really an excellent exhibition and includes asking the question of the curators for themselves, are we going to reinforce stereotypes by having this as the focus of a curated exhibition in a Jewish institution, and they argue no, and I would agree. What was missing from all of the ways of thinking about Jews is anything to do with where do Jews come from? They don't begin in Europe. Jews begin in Arabia and the Middle East. So in fact, if one speaks about indigeneity, which is another popular concept, it's acquired a lot of traction over the last decade, 15 years, then certainly Jews and the history of Jews as a people, as an idea, as an identity, um, should be included. And one of the people, of course, that one can reference very easily is someone that many American Jews and American Christians know nothing about, and that is um, Maimonides, or the Rambam, who was considered a significant person in his lifetime in Egypt, he wrote in Arabic, and he was highly cited. He was a medical doctor. He was, in general, intellectual of many different crafts. And you can Wikipedia him. In my class, and to you, I would say, you, we need to think about the various vocabularies that are being circulated, again, in the 20, 2019, on campuses, outside of their historic context. We're hearing the term ghetto without students and sometimes their professors realizing that the term comes specifically from Venice, which is why Shakespeare wrote The Merchant of Venice and Shylock. I had my students see a movie which is quite boring, but you know, it was an attempt to make the film accessible to a younger audience. And I give them the film to watch, and I give them two essays written in the 1950s, so it's closer to World War II, and ask, one essay argues for the performance of the play, one argues against the performance, again, in the context of, of, of different perspectives on the same text. But what's important about the notion of ghetto in this context and the Merchant of Venice is, again, the Merchant of Venice is not about Europe as we think of Europe today. It's not simply about white Europe. That, idea does not exist. It's in the context of Christian Europe, and it's also in the context of Venice acting as a bridge between Europe and the rest of the world. So we have a reminder that the Middle East, that Africa, that India were significant, significant also as points of trade, it takes Jews outside of simply the European context. So I'm going to take a moment for you to think and take a look at this picture. This has to do with how do we interpret, how do we think about history, what do we know, and how do we take what we know and interpret without thinking too deeply. So is there some brave person, since you're not looking at each other, you're all looking at me or at the screen, but can somebody please tell me who in the picture is black and who in the picture is white and how do you know? It's a real question. Um, okay, so based on the picture on the left, um, I think both of them, I mean, okay, obviously the girl in the white is, she has a different skin color, but they're being treated both as black and white based on how they're holding each other because during that time frame, I wouldn't imagine seeing a white child um, next to a black child. Okay, so you get hired, as soon as you get your PhD, you're hired. That's exactly the answer. And that's unusual for people to know the answer, but that's correct. In this time period, 1862, 1863, the question, who is black and who is white, would not have been asked. It wouldn't even have been thought. Not only because the vocabulary wasn't there, 
but the vocabulary was who is free and who is slave. And that was based on ancestry. Never in US American history was the definition of a slave or the definition of a Negro based on appearance. And yes, the way that they're holding themselves intimately, that's how people would have known that the little girl who has white skin was simply white skin Negro, a white skin colored person in the sense that it would say what her skin color was, but her racial status would have been something different. Um, we have this notion of race. So as I say, now I'm going to be skipping zigzag. We have the notion of race. The notion of race has come back into style, can become popular again. It is something that I and a colleague of mine teach a course on race and through genetics to try to uproot this egregious idea that actually is banned from German, banned from French, but still imported out of the United States, has come back into research despite the fact that in two, the year 2000, the Genome Project was proudly presented to the world as proof that human beings cannot be divided into races, but we still have races. The term of race, we think of today, or a younger generation particularly, thinks of race in terms of color and appearance. But that was not true 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 70 years ago. So I have this map here, again jumping back and forth, in between the 1870s and the 1920s, the nativist movement in America, very similar to the nativist movement today, sometimes with the same images, sometimes with different, we're different living at a different time, strongly objected to the huge number of immigrants who were coming from Eastern Europe and from Southern Europe and from Ireland. The groups that they hated the most in no particular order, were Jews, were Irish Catholic, and were Italians, Southern Italians in particular. The nativist movement gains traction and finally succeeds in passage of the 1924 Johnson-Reed Act. That closes the door to open immigration. Part of the campaign were caricatures like this, which appeared in none other than Harper's Magazine, than The Atlantic. It is not difficult to send students to look at Harper's and The Atlantic, which were prestigious then and continue to be prestigious uh, magazines, and to find not only the cartoons, but also references, or to go to the New York Times and find egregious racist imagery that will be recognizable today as simply racist but no longer necessarily used for people who were coming from Europe as the, as the main site. Now, at the same time period, there is not an overwhelming flow of immigration from North Africa or from the Middle East. Therefore, we don't think about North Africa and the Middle East in the United States in this time period. Instead, there are individuals. Looking at this chart, does anybody know what this chart is? I'm sure most of you do, but... This is from Nuremberg. These are the Nuremberg Laws which were introduced. One of the reasons, and this again is a footnote just to be aware of, one of the reasons for the law of return in Israel is not just that a person has to be Jewish to gain immediate citizenship. No, no, it's, it's not actually. They use, yeah, in a way, yes, but not. They use the Nuremberg laws rather than rabbinical laws because at this point, you had no place to go. So why do I point this out now? Just again, as one of those reference points for discussion of who has access to citizenship and who doesn't. Everybody has access to applying for citizenship who has immediate access and under what terms, under these terms. Now, as a secondary footnote, just you know, to bring it into conversation so that you have it in your notes or you have it at least in your memory, um, there was a very famous case in the 1950s 
of a Christian, uh, I think he was Dominican, but France, Brother Daniel. Anybody know, familiar with the case of Brother Daniel? Okay, so Brother Daniel wanted to have, he'd been living in Israel, he wanted to have citizenship on the basis of being the child of a, of a Jewish mother. And here the political realm and the rabbinical realm divided completely. The rabbinical realm said there's no such thing as stopping being Jewish. Once you're Jewish, you're Jewish. Not that it's racial, which becomes difficult to explain, but it's not because it's racially inherited. The political realm, the Knesset, the parliament at the time, decided no, he could not have citizenship under the terms of return because he had not only converted, but he had remained a Catholic. And for those of you who are familiar with Archbishop Lustiger of Paris, he's dead now, at the time, he came to visit Israel and it was the same ambivalence. Even though he, has, he was Jewish under rabbinical law, because he had continued to be a converted Catholic, a devout converted Catholic, the political realm rejected him. So Nuremberg has ramifications way beyond simply World War II and does fit into racial identities. But the reason I'm making this point is to bring it back to the United States and also to the ways in which people of African descent in the United States self-identify. Some of the ways in which people self-identify, however, today in 2019 among a younger generation is beginning to shift. We're seeing much more fluidity, much more um, discomfort with being put into little boxes. And again, as one is doing a syllabus on anti-Semitism, the question of who is a Jew, what is a Jew, what is Judaism, how do these terms indicate membership? Jews are not a race. Jews are not an ethnic group, Jews do not belong to one geographical location, Jews don't speak the same language, Jews don't eat the same food, Jews don't even have the same liturgy. So what makes Jews? Well, you know, Amos Oz has a book, I just recently purchased it on words, and in his last chapter on vocabulary, he points out, we Jews, in quotation marks, and then he goes on to say, well, where did the expression come from? If you look for it, it has many different authors because there's not one answer. Going back to the notion of whiteness in the context of North America, which will bring us to the BDS, these are three books which are extraordinarily important books. They were intended to open up a discussion of Jews in America and where they fit in the power structure, in the social fabric, in the political mapping of a re- organized America where anti-Semitism seemed to have disappeared. Now what makes these books interesting today, again in 2019, as opposed to 1996, 1995 when, when they were originally published, what makes it interesting is that we've had Pittsburgh and Charlottesville. And a younger generation whose grandparents were part of the 60s and still saying, you know, I'm not white, I'm Jewish. Or maybe people think I'm white, but I'm Jewish. That's my primary identity. That's why my suitcase is packed by the door, metaphorically or literally in some cases. A younger generation never thought about it. And this is especially true I've experienced in the Midwest. They just got comfortable just being white. The forward reinforces that today. A lot of different news stories, reports, magazines, discussions, we've got a new vocabulary, a new adjective has come about that has institutionalized itself. White Jews. <laughs> what are white Jews? Were my grandparents white Jews when they had to beg to leave? What are white Jews? What are white Jews to the neo-Nazis in Charlottesville? The term is an oxymoron, but the term has also become normalized. It also stilts the conversation when we get to the topic of Israel. A Gentleman's Agreement, which won the Oscar, if you don't know the film, you should look it up. It's like one of those landmark films that should be seen along with Casablanca. Just forget about the sexism that you, you know, might disagree with today. 
And there's some films that are classic and they carry a message of the time. Gentleman's Agreement won the Oscar. There's a second film that came out exactly at the same time called Crossfire. It's about, it has, well, it's about an American soldier um, who commits a murder of someone Jewish and there's a very long dialogue about anti-Semitism, about being Irish and now being American and how we shouldn't be anti-Semitic. But those two films are key films in helping to educate consciously, to educate the American collective, to think that Jews are like everybody else. Jews are like Christians. Jews are like us. And in Gentlemen's Agreement, there is actually a reference which says, there's no difference between us. They go, we go to church, they go to temple. Gone is 3,000 years of history. They're white like us. Another example of learning to be white and learning to quote unquote see Jews as white, with white having a particular meaning that goes beyond skin color, but now is calcified as a racial identity, which is ahistoric, but which comes to be taken for granted, were commercials, advertisements, which were posted all over New York. I don't know about the rest of the country. I've discovered that it, you know, it's not very familiar to people who are not from New York or LA. But Libby's bread was a very delicious bread, actually. I remember as a kid. It was a very good bread. They, they don't exist anymore. And how did they popularize themselves? They popularized with this advertisement, which was to show people who were the exact opposite of what anybody thought of as being Jewish. So you even have Malcolm X. I think the Malcolm X was done a little bit later and it was done as, as a joke. But the others are actual uh, examples of the advertisements that were in newspapers, in subways, on buses. This helped, along with Seinfeld and the nanny and, other, and Woody Allen, helped to put in people's minds the idea that Jews are white. So if we come now to 2019, to the constant reiteration of white Jews as an expression, where the adjective takes on the equal significance as the noun, it's not difficult to understand why the term people of color comes to exclude Jews, rather than include the fact that Jews, like Arab Muslims, come in all kinds of colors come from all sorts of places. And Europe is just one of the places, but it's also not the original site. Everything I've said, I'm not going to go over with the census, but for those of you who are from North America or follow North American politics, then knowing the politics behind the categories in the US census is important. And it's particularly important for this one reason. There has been a debate for a couple of years now over whether there should be an Arab category added. Now, one of the arguments for the racial categories altogether is that you cannot monitor discrimination without some criteria. How can I know that the bank is discriminating against me in the mortgage terms if there's nothing to show some difference between me and my colleague? So for that purpose, and that purpose alone, in 1977, and again in 1997, a public decision uh, was made to keep the categories. But then what does one do with an Arab category? So the question in the debate that has come up, and it's been muted in different places, but it's there. Who is an Arab? Arab is not even defined by the Arab League. There are Arabs who are Jews, who come from Jewish Arab environments in which Arabic was the first language. Arabic was previous to Yiddish as part of Jewish history. Jews were in Arabia long before they were in Europe. Some Arabs are Muslim, some Arabs are Christian, and there are other dominant denominations which are perhaps smaller. So Arab as a category on its own cannot simply relate to the assumption of Muslim as co-equivalent to Arab, because most Muslims are from Malaysia and Indonesia. Can't be a category just for the Middle East, because there are lots of Jews who come from the Middle East, including Israel, and Israeli Jews, and Israelis who are not Jewish. So the Middle East can't be that category. 
So the debate over a category for Middle East and Arab in order to monitor discriminatory patterns has met a, a wall. It's uh, kind of just standing there. But this is something that one should be aware of in teaching about who are we referencing when we ask certain questions about the past. I like this particular out of context of what I've said um, poster. Everybody's heard of W.E.B. Du Bois? Yes? Have, has everybody heard of the Pan-African Conferences? Well, the last was 1945. I think the last was 19, major one was 1945 and took place in Manchester. And if you'll notice, um, I think I have a, I don't know, well, anyway. If you notice on the far left, Arabs and Jews unite against British imperialism. How many of you hear about this? Is it in the news? Is it referenced? Is it in the history books? Does it even come up? I came across this by accident one day when I was Googling something on Du Bois. I was trying to find something in Pan African Con, and this popped up. And I wondered, hmm, is this accurate? Is it not? And I kept looking for it. But then I decided I would try to find it in a book. And I so far have not been able to. This is part of what I call erasure or omission. It is erasure because it had disappeared. It will be omission if you, in the plural, don't pass it on to your students or your colleagues because now you know about it. And on the far opposite side, down with anti-Semitism. So at the 1945 Pan-African Congress, talking about anti-Semitism was important because this is the moment in which discussions of nationalism were taking place. Now, if one is opposed to nationalism as an ideological stance, then one is opposed to nationalism. It really doesn't matter who is arguing for their own independent place. If one is talking with the language of Benedict Anderson and the notion of invention, well, we all invent ourselves. The example I gave in the other room, which works for students probably better than for a faculty, is at 2 o'clock in the morning, do you want your parents coming over to your dorm room looking for you? No, because then you're the child and you're misbehaving, maybe not studying. We all invent ourselves. We invent ourselves when we meet other people and they don't know who we are. We don't want the people who don't like us to come along and say, oh, don't talk to her, don't talk to him. This is who they really are. You know, give me the goods. We all invent ourselves, but Jews invented themselves at Mount Sinai is one way to look at it. That means the idea of Jews as a people, with all of the arguments, with all of the disagreements, with the fact that if you have three Jews, you have seven opinions, and it depends what time of day, right? Well, why shouldn't Jews have a national collective identity? And then we come back to the Pan-African Congress, and we can remember that African countries, African nationalist leaders, Asian nationalist leaders, even South American nationalist leaders, and here I'm thinking about the young Castro, believed in Jewish nationalism. So this is an opportunity to talk about, to introduce in a classroom, the idea of nationalism, and do we criticize the country's existence, or do we criticize a country's independence? I'm sorry, a country's policies. If we're criticizing policies, then we can discuss Israel in a comparative way. We can discuss revolutions in a comparative way. Anyway, we end up with the idea that there are very few isms that have worked out well. The Algerians are still trying to figure out how to have a successful revolution. South Africa is still trying to figure out how to have a successful transition. And Israel is still trying to figure out how to be a democratic country. So just to come back to the notion of whiteness in America, because this is something we're finding repeatedly in almost all of the print media, social media, 
And I was thinking to myself, what language to use, because I found that we are losing vocabulary because vocabulary is beginning to be eroded of its ability to communicate accurately or in ways that are provocative enough to have dialogue. So I was going to say left, but I can't say left. I was going to say progressive, but I can't say progressive. So I'll just say those groups which question the existence of Israel and not just the policies, those are the groups in which we find a lot of discussion of white privilege, which I think is useful. The fact is, if I walk down the street, if I'm driving my car, if I go into a store and I'm already older, wiser, richer, I still am aware of the fact that I'm walking around in brown skin. Having said that, those groups which have placed whiteness above Jewishness also call Israel into question and often are the groups that are arguing that Israel is an occupier in the Middle East, an occupier that represents a European invasion at the expense of the indigenous population. And this argument is a very toxic one, and it cannot be refuted if we don't also at the same time confront the way in which the notion of white privilege has almost appropriated Jewish history. So in this quote, <coughs> excuse me, Gil Steinhoff um, in 2015 wrote, and you can, you, know, you can see it, I sometimes am in an audience, I think, why is somebody reading what can be read on your own? But one of the advantages of reading it is it puts it out loud, we can hear it collectively. And so I'm going to read it, if you don't mind. Jews in America struggled for decades to become white. Now we must give up whiteness to fight racism. Let's teach our children that we are, in fact, not white, but simply Jewish. Now, as a caveat to this, not as a footnote, but as an addendum, we can begin to say that there's a problem partially in this comment, because it presumes that all Jews are white. But in fact, I would argue that that's not really what his intent was. I think he was speaking to a synagogue where most of the people in the synagogue look white. When they go outside, they are treated as if they're white. They're not wearing a kippah, so they're not necessarily identified as Jewish per se. And so what he's arguing is that too many Jews who happen to be of Ashkenazi European descent, and I sometimes laugh about that because I'm Ashkenazi, and my husband who um, his mother's from Algeria and his father's seven generations Jerusalemite and he looks white, but actually he's the Mizrahi in the family, he's not me. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the reality is that we don't hear enough about Jews who are not of Ashkenazi European background. Moreover, we don't hear enough about just simply Jews with the diversity there, not pointing it out. I would argue that we don't yet have our Shonda Rhimes. Nobody knows who that is. Okay, good, good. There was a period when students knew never to start me on Thursday night. That's sort of disappearing. And How to Get Away with Murder is going to be ending this season, if you haven't heard yet. Now you know. But Shonda Rhimes, what did she do? She created no stereotypes. You don't know who anybody is, because each time there's a little bit of ingredient that's thrown into the script, and then you thought she was white, but it turns out, is she Latina? Oh, he was black, but oh, but he actually, he is black, but he's something else. We don't yet have that in some of the Jewish texts which are appearing now in the public arena. We have extremes, and this is why I showed you also the picture of the two slave children. The extreme attracts our attention, but actually slaves came in a multi-range of ivory to ebony, and the same can be said for Jews. But if you place people who look very different, you've exoticized both. And this also, I argue, is a problem. Now what is true is that we have more and more films about Israel that are accessible with English translations, with French translations, with Spanish translations, even with Arabic translations, 
coming out of Israel. Some of them are excellent. They're appearing on Netflix. I just, to be honest, finished because I can't get it in France because of French copyright. But last night we finished the last three episodes of season two of Stitzel. Now, last year I spoke about Fauda. But if we take Fauda and we take Stitzel and we put them together, there's a whole lot of material there for a separate course, definitely not a course on anti-Semitism, because then we're going to kind of entrap ourselves with some of the domestic policies of Israel. But I bring these two examples to say that in both of those films, which our students are watching, I know about Stitzel from Christian students, not even from Jewish students, what we find is that there's very little represent representation of Ashkenazim in Fauda, and there's very little representation of Mizrahim in Stitzel. And if you read the English translation, a couple of times we switched, we, we replayed a scene to see the difference between English subtitle and Hebrew, and it wasn't the same at all. Okay, so what I'm suggesting to you is that today, many of the people who are adamantly anti-Israel, who are part of the BDS, who are part of a group of people who really would like to see Israel disappear from the map, have absolutely no understanding, no consciousness, and very little accurate knowledge about Israel, about Jews, about the Middle East, about Muhammad and the relationship of Muhammad to his Jewish wives. A lot of information is missing, and our task is how do we fill in the gaps in what essentially is a 12 to 14 week semester? And that, I suggest, is very difficult. So if I take this picture, Jews of Global People, a collage that I put, to, I had my student actually put together. I asked him to take pictures and to find pictures that would stand out. In fact, in today's world, globalization means that people are wearing clothes that are similar all over the place. They're eating foods that are similar. They go to the Gap, they go to Dior, they go to, you know, wherever. You can't really tell where people are from by what they wear. Uh, so some of these images are outdated, but they are the images of grandparents or great-grandparents. But these are the images that many of our students, many of our young people, many of young faculty, and when I say young faculty, I mean in their 40s, they weren't educated to even see these images, so how can they possibly teach it to students who are in their 20s? And that, perhaps, is the most egregious, most challenging um, obstacle right now to teaching about anti-Semitism in a global context. This image as well. Sometimes I show this image, I often show this image with the image of the two children that you saw before, but sometimes I show it without the text at the bottom, and I simply ask the question, Sometimes I leave it in. Now, uh, we don't have time for, to, to, to play games here, but I'll point out two things which you probably noticed. So if you did, I apologize for being redundant. But both men could be either Jewish or Arab. And the problem with the sentence, after they've read in my syllabus articles about Arab Jews and Jews from Arab countries, the problem is the sentence itself. The question is a bad question. They very well may be. No, they very well may be. Well, actually, no. That is exactly the problem. That if they both come from Iraq, if they both come from Lebanon, if they go, both come from Morocco, if they both come from Iran, they both may be coming from any place. Arab is not an ethnicity. That's all it is. So they both may be Jewish, they both may be Muslim, but the notion of is one Jewish and is one Arab, that is a bad sentence. That is a bad question. That is not a question to ask. Any more than is one black and is one white when we're talking about the South before the end of slavery, or in fact, if we're talking about the South immediately after slavery, because when slavery ends, segregation and Jim Crow don't end. The law fixes itself to say anybody with a drop of African blood is a colored person. The first of those laws is Virginia and the Racial Integrity Act. So I point this out to say 
as students, as professors, you want to think about what do the questions that we ask sometimes presume? Because it's that presumption that can reinforce certain attitudes which are the opposite of what we want to accomplish. And that perhaps is the most challenging of all. How do we identify our own perspectives that, are, that need analysis, that need unpacking? And that the only way to do that is in conversation with others. The only way to do that is to look at a question and say, okay, what does my question presume? And so what is my question that would be inherent here? What does the question presume? It presumes a juxtaposition between Jewish and Arab. And that's why it's a bad question. And the question before, who is black and who is white, also presumes a difference which itself was problematic. So I want to just call to your attention that we can spend a lot of time talking about Muslims who are anti-Israel, Muslims who are anti-Jewish, Jews who are anti-Muslim. I think it's very useful to also give a lot of attention, not to just the negative, but also to some of the coalitions and the context within which certain coalitions are coming about. And why are they coming about? And the ways in that context the white supremacy is not something of the past. It is something which is quite current. It is something which we need to deal with, which we need to think about. Um, these terms are just, and you'll get, you'll, you'll have access anyway to, to this PowerPoint. But these are some of the terms that I start at the beginning of the year, the first assignment before the class even meets, they have to look these terms up because these are so recurrent. And when they first, students first see these terms, you know, it's kind of, they go to Wikipedia. I ask them not to, but they go to Wikipedia, it's easier. But once it's up and they've done that, it's surprising how often these terms will come up currently, now, recently, and not just as some uh, old historic term that's forgotten. So I have been guided by this notion. I don't know whether you can see it, but, um, I was raised to think that one should not stand and curse the darkness, but one should light a light. And the other is, it is not incumbent upon thee to complete the task, but thou must not therefore desist from it. Which means that I might not reach all 15 students. I might not reach 10 students. I might not even reach five students. But if I reach one student, and as I have learned, that one student goes on to get a PhD, that student is already going to reach another 15 students. And that's how we progress. If not, we can just shut the door, go to sleep, turn on Netflix, disappear. So I know that you need to have a little bit of activity. You've heard me too long, and we only have a little bit of time left. I gave you index cards, and I would like, on one side of your index card, if you can write where your people are from. Now, that does not mean who do you identify with. It's sort of thinking about what are the different places that people had to leave so that you would be wherever it is that you're leaving today. And I'll give you a little extra information to, that I say to students so that you can think about as you're doing it very quickly. If you just put down a country then you're putting it now in a country of 2019 that might not have existed in the past. So the exercise of where are your people from means you have to think beyond just Ireland. You know, is it Irish Catholic or is it Irish Protestant? It matters in a Boston pub. If it's China, well, there are many different groups in China. If it's whatever country it is, there's more than just the geography. So that's you know, write that down and see how much you know about your past in terms of geographies of movement. And on the other side of your card, if you can write down what are your two main goals, if you are a professor or a teacher in a classroom, or if you're a student and you want to do a workshop for the students, what are the two takeaways, just two takeaways, that you want people to remember long after they've forgotten everything else? And the third, on that same side, who's your target audience? Yes, so the first question is about geographical backgrounds, where people came from, 
on the other side, goals, that would be your educational goals. What goals do you want? And the tie into that is your intended audience. And I'll give you just five minutes uh, for that, and then I will tell you what mine are, and then our session will be over. You can talk to each other while you're doing that. Oh, I get to move. Is it on? Yes, it's on. Okay, did you make much progress? So, before telling you my goals and my target audience, let me just run through a couple of words that are difficult to see in the back, I know, but I think are useful. So one is the notion of prescriptive, Prescriptive being a question or a syllabus or a text that you choose that's leading to an answer. The questions already have the answer built in, so there's no place to think. It becomes ideological. Polemic. Polemic is easy because of the kind of vocabulary that's used. There are texts which are written in a way that you read the first paragraph and you already know that this is ideological and partisan. And so there's no place to debate, there's no place to engage, there's nothing to research, there's no question to ask. Political, well, I believe that everything is political, it's just whether it's a capital P political or small p political, but it's political. But if you can say, I know that this is political, I know this is the perspective of the person, but I'm not reading it for that, I don't have to agree or disagree. I'm reading it for some information that becomes a base to ask other questions, then political is not always bad. Polemical, I think, in a classroom is not a positive thing. Advocacy, partisanship, and propaganda. How does that compare to being a professor? Right? To, being, to profess is not necessarily to preach, even though they come from the same root and even though the line between the two is very thin. Because as professors, we are trying to get certain points across. But that's not the same thing as engaging in propaganda. What are the preconceptions, the premises, the presumptions of an article that we assign, a book that we assign? How do we make that transparent? So my aim is to try to get students and to try to get colleagues to understand the notion of transparency. Transparency means you can easily check my sources, but my sources also debate each other. They're not 
one-sided. Now, that does not mean that we don't have red lines. I'm not going to present in class a text that argues objectively with neutral language that there's anything positive about slavery or about xenophobia or any number of topics that we can think of that are egregious. But those are the red lines. You have to decide your red lines. What As an equal argument, because, I, because that would be my red line, that to argue that there's merit to slavery, for me, is off the table. To have a discussion about the reasons that slavery contributed to the development of economy, that's a different question. So one is an argument that is arguing for slavery. The other is trying to understand how does slavery as an institution, as an economic institution, how does it reproduce itself? Because that will lead us to talk about what happens when slavery is no longer on the table. I mean, apartheid ends at the moment in which it is economically not feasible, in that particular moment. Yeah. So it's acceptable as an educator to be able to say, this is the line that I draw, and you may draw a different line. Right, but it, does, it wouldn't mean that I wouldn't bring in texts if we're looking at the 19th century. I wouldn't, or 18th century, I wouldn't bring, I, would, I might bring in texts of people who argued for slavery, but for a student to argue out of belief that there's something positive about slavery, that's off the table. Or for someone to be a white supremacist in my class, and argue the merits of Nazism, even though they went a little bit too far. You know, they didn't have to go that far. They didn't have to burn everybody, incinerate everybody. That would be off the table. Uh, there's one film which I forgot to mention, which I really encourage everybody to see, and that's called Son of Saul. If you have not seen Son of Saul, you really must put it high on your agenda, because Son of Saul makes it very clear, the cacophony, the multiple languages. People didn't have anything in common with each other except for one thing, and that's that they were Jewish. And beyond that, there's not much more to say. There's no dialogue. The dialogue is a, a, a kind of background rhythm, but it's a very important film. So does that answer your question? Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, points of departure and perspective. That's very important to make very transparent. What's the point of departure of an article? So in terms of the material that you have as a text or that you as students would be looking for to do a research paper, you want to, where, what is the point of departure? What's the context? Because that helps put other readings or other films or other material, other texts into a context, a historical context or a situational context. Um, I have here, uh, maximizing objectivity, it's not my term, it comes from Susan Harding, but the idea of maximizing objectivity is not that there's any such thing as objectivity, we know that there is not. But what is possible, what is always possible, is try to maximize finding counter-arguments to our own. And that's the purpose of an academic education, in my opinion. And it's very challenging, because it's very difficult to uproot and to unlearn things that have been naturalized and normalized. So I said in, in closing, my goals for my course on anti-Semitism, and I will share that syllabus so that you'll have access to it, is number one, that students walk away understanding that Jews did not begin in Europe. That the history of the Jewish people is a history of diversity and of conflict internally that the debates have always been around. So that's one. And that Jews don't fit any social science category, and this is an anomaly that they have to just accept. So Western social science categories created in Europe for purposes that are their own political purposes that one can study if they want, they don't work when it comes to Jews. I would argue that today they probably do not work for Muslims because now Muslim students, Muslim professors, Islam in America has now taken root, and some of the challenges that faced Jewish immigrants in an earlier time are going to and already are affecting younger Muslim students. It's not a religion alone, it's not a race, it's not an ethnicity, it doesn't fit any social science category. But that's not my topic, but I want it said.
I want people to be able to think about it. A second goal is that when students walk away from my class, they understand that there is a, such a thing that is called political anti-Semitism. So there's theological anti-Semitism. In the other room I said what I'll say now, I believe that theological anti-Semitism is still alive and well within evangelical circles. I don't think that that has disappeared. There is still racial anti-Semitism. It is definitely not the kind of the 1930s. As far as we know, that has passed, but it existed. There is social anti-Semitism, which is, well, I don't really want any, I don't want you marrying somebody who's Jewish. I don't really want any Jews around, but I'm not Jewish, I'm white. No, well, you know. Okay, so social anti-Semitism has not completely disappeared. It's certainly not what it used to be. And political anti-Semitism is the trickiest, and that really is what your summer seminar is about. How does one distinguish between anti-Jewish, anti-Jewishness, and anti-Israel, the state, as opposed to policies? So I offer my students, um, even though I don't agree with this political politics, I offer my students three criteria to think about in consideration of what is political anti-Semitism when it comes to the state of Israel, and that's Sharansky's three Ds, which is double standards, demonization, and delegitimization. That is to say that one can be totally opposed to the Israeli government policies because we can't run away and hide and bury our heads in the sand when most Israeli newspapers are now translated in English, and if they're not, anybody can simply go to Google Translate. Translation won't be perfect, but you can translate. You can't hide anymore. You know, it's like the old Negro spiritual, no place to hide, no rock to hide under. Um, so we have to confront that head on, but that doesn't mean it has to be part of the syllabus. But what I'd like them to walk away from is to being able to make that differentiation and therefore be able to criticize the BDS movement, which I agree happens to be one of the most egregious movements at the moment, in part because it has been, become such a source of obsession that very intelligent people can carry out excellent political analysis, social analysis, economic analysis on every place in the world until you say the word Israel. And that's where in intellectual depth somehow stops. And so what I would argue is I would like my students to walk away understanding that yes, of course you can criticize Israel. That's not our course, that's a different course, but you do need to understand what defines political anti-Semitism. So those thoughts are my reflections which I offer you today. If they're useful, good. If they're not, you know, that's okay too. And that's it, you're free. I, if there are comments or if there are questions, there's five minutes, I'm told, um, for people to not ask me questions, but just offer your own I thoughts. I wish I were in your class. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I actually have a question. Yes. Um, it's about white Jews as an oxymoron, and I totally get that when we're looking at the racial definition of Jews as an oxymoron. And the notion of white privilege, how do you navigate the notion that if I were to walk through a 7-Eleven, it would not be with the same consciousness against the notion that Jews as Jews are in fact different than whites? I'm stuck in the middle of that. And I'd love to know how we... Yes, and I complete. I mean, I, it's not that I don't understand or sympathize, and I have not shown pictures of my children, but I will say this. Not my mother, who was a refugee, there's no other way. I grew up being taught to simply say she is a, ref a refugee, period. She's Jewish, period. The, the idea of thinking about it outside of those terms didn't exist. The idea of thinking of white Jews, the way that the term is being deployed now, I have found not only egregious, but it has become so endemic to writing. To argue about what it is to be treated as white when somebody doesn't know who you are of course, that's access to privilege. That is definitely access to privilege. 
but that's separate from being someone who's Jewish. And once you use the adjective as opposed to the conjunction, you can say, I am white and Jewish. You can say, I'm treated as a white person, but I'm Jewish, or and I'm Jewish, because I think the and is much more important than the but. That's what makes the difference. Because in Pittsburgh, they didn't stop to say, oh, let's differentiate. Who are the white people? In Algeria, I mean, it's the people, this is part of erasure and omission. In Algeria, many of you may know, some of you may not know, but in 18, I've forgotten now the date, it was one of the uh, things to look up on, on my list. Europe, France wanted to differentiate, wanted to divide, divide and conquer. So they extended citizenship to Jews. So there were three categories in Algeria, European, Jewish, and Muslim. What's the problem with that when World War II comes along? The Jews of Morocco can turn and did turn to the king and said, we are a protected minority. And the king, Muhammad V, I think it is, extended his protection and has been loved forever since. But in Algeria, the Jews who thought they were just French were deported. Many of them were deported. In Tunisia, camps were set up. I didn't get to that part because there's too much. You can't do everything in 14 weeks and certainly not in an hour and a half and certainly not in late afternoon. But Tunisia, the Nazis arrived. They built camps. They started to deport and they started to put in the labor camps. The last part to answer your question, which is a troubling one because it becomes polemic only because it's not being argued. Many of the, some of the Palestinians who are under the umbrella of people of color, and I don't think that we, should not that we should not not confront the question of what people of color has come to mean as part of oppression. But some of those people are people with white skin just like you. Palestinians don't seem to be agonizing over whether or not they're white Palestinian or brown Palestinian. This has become a question that's debated and asked in the Jewish press and has then moved out. And that's what I'm calling to people's attention. I have an article that appeared in Eisgap's newsletter in which I question the way in which we're spending more time, or Jewish newspapers at any rate, are spending a lot of time on the question of white Jews versus black Jews versus Jews of color rather than the content of what Jewishness is all about. So I agree the notion of privilege has to still be confronted, but it should be confronted as two separate issues because Jewishness and whiteness, sometimes they cohabit, and often they come into conflict. Th th that's a quick answer. One minute and... Hey, sorry. Uh, thank you so much, that was great. Um, there was a study on identity, on woman identity in America, um, and African-American women and Jewish women were the ones that felt uh, the most identified as their African-American or Jewish. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on that, so how can gender play a role why were Jewish women so, um, I guess, you mentioned Jewish. Uh, it was a really interesting thing that I learned that I was wondering what you were thinking. The Jewish women, they felt really Jewish. Like, th that was a huge part of their identity uh, as African-American women, but other women like Irish-American or Italian-American wouldn't necessarily feel, uh, you know, Irish or <coughs> Because I think when you say Irish-American, there's a relationship to Ireland that is always there, but that after a while disappears. So you can go back to Ireland. No one questions your Irishness, just how long you've been away. Where are Jewish Americans supposed to think of themselves in relationship to other Jews in the world and in relation to, to the United States outside of a context of Jewishness in opposition? Which isn't to say that Sartre was right and that Jews exist because of the anti-Semite. This is a footnote for those of you familiar with that essay. But it is to say that the notion of Jewish identity as something which is at core singular and at core in conflict sometimes with the host countries is very similar to the way in which people of African descent in America, yes, they are American, but there's always this still question. And we can definitely see how that racism is functioning right now, just this week, and calling into question 
people's credentials as American. So to be black and to be American sometimes can be seen as an oxymoron. I don't think quite in the same way. I don't think the analogy is excellent. But I think the questions that are asked about collective identity and political positioning are very, very similar, coming out of the same histories that one likes to see as alliances and alienation from groups that should be aligned or not. So that's a partial answer to, a, to, to your question. But the text that you read has to be read in conjunction, I would say, with other texts and other debates, including the debate over whiteness and whether the Jews that are in that book that are represented represent contemporary Jews in America who really today are coming from a wide range of backgrounds. It's not predominantly Ashkenazi anymore. I'm not sure whether it's 90%, 5%. One of the biggest problems and questions that have been raised over the years, and increasingly, is who among the Jewish community is being, within the Jewish community by Jewish organizations, who's being counted and who isn't. Uh, Miami, New York, Atlanta now have many, many immigrants not coming directly from North Africa, but coming from Israel. And they're not necessarily in the same Ashkenazi circles that are, that are being uh, numbered. Thanks for letting us sit in on your class. <laughs>